Hello, this is Tim Chen. I'm a postdoc at EPFL in the Geometric Computing Laboratory. Together with my co-authors, I would like to present bistable exotic surface structures. Our structure consists of a flexible material that's laser cut in 2D. Once deployed, the 3D shape attains a structural rigidity. There's been a tremendous amount of interest of late in the design and fabrication of deployable structures. Starting with the utilization of a regular pattern such as a scissor mechanism and simple actuation, we're able to design such deployable platforms. By increasing the complexity at the boundary, but still using a regular pattern, we can achieve freeform structures. Conversely, if we optimize the internal pattern of the structure, we can simplify the boundary and still achieve freeformed shapes. There's a number of challenges associated with deployable structures. In this example of oxidic deployables, pneumatic pressure is needed to keep the structure in 3D. Once the pressure is removed, the structure collapses back to its 2D state. This is an example of a deployable structure built using oxidic material. So what exactly is an oxidic material? In traditional materials, when stretched in one dimension, the length typically decreases in the other dimension. And we can quantify this using a term called Poisson's ratio, which is typically above zero. In other materials, when stretching open in one direction actually increases length in the other, and consequently, the Poisson's ratio is below zero. In our triangular exotics, the Poisson's ratio is actually negative one, which means the increasing length is the same in both directions. And this is how such a deployable structure is opened. Raf Sanjani, in a recent paper, nicely summarized the difference between conventional triangular aesthetic, which closes back up when the stretching force is removed, and bistable triangular aesthetic, in which, after the removal of the stretching force, stays open. We aim to use this pattern in conjunction with geometric frustration to design our deployable structures. So let's look at the shape in more detail. We notice that such a shape consists of a tiling of regular hexagonal units. So let's look at one of these units. We note within such a unit, there are six identical triangles, each with three cut lines. And such a triangle can be parameterized using variables T and theta. Now let's pay attention to the size of the inner triangle. We note that with increasing theta, the size of the inner triangle decreases. Similarly, by increasing T, the size of the inner triangle also decreases. We aim to understand the kinematics of the opening of such a unit cell. We first analytically derive the minimum and the maximum thickness for a given theta. Note that outside of these bounds, the unit cell is either physically not realizable or not bistable. Now, if we assume the width of the unit cell is L, and then by rotating the inner triangles, we can obtain the open shape. And with this open shape, we can quantify an analytical stretch, which is one plus delta over L. And by plotting this contour map, we note that the stretch ranges from one to two. Interestingly, we notice for a given stretch, there are infinitely many parameterizations of T and theta that can achieve the stretch. And therefore, we need to come up with an additional criteria to select the best unit cell for a given stretch factor. And we also need to define what best means in this case. We study the mechanics of opening of these unit cells to come up with some selection criteria. Let's rewatch the opening sequence again. We note gaps form in the intermediate states during the expansion. And these gaps indicate that the material is being stretched. At further opening angles, these gaps close and the material is compatible again. This hints at the bistable nature of such a unit cell. We utilize FEM in conjunction with periodic boundary condition to simulate the opening of these unit cells. By incrementally increasing the stretch along the x-axis, we can obtain the corresponding st strain energy for every step. And here's an example of one of the unit cells being opened. We note in the energy landscape, there are two clear local minima at these two points, suggesting these are the stable equilibrium states. If we differentiate this energy curve, we obtain the force versus strain curve, 
in which we again see clearly at point one and five are the two stable equilibria and at point three is an unstable one. Let's look at the distribution of, of principal stress over the surface as the, the unit cell is opened. We note at point five, the stress is concentrated at the hinges as expected. However, in the intermediate states, the stress is distributed across the entire surface. And now we can come up with two different criteria for the selection. The first is to maximize by stability, or that's to say to maximize delta E or the energy between the local maximum and the local minimum. Alternatively, we can maximize the stiffness at the second equilibrium state or the slope of the fourth string curve at 0.5. First, we validate the FEM simulation by comparing this to experiment. So we chose two extreme parameterizations and validate that the shape at the open state is identical from simulation and experiment. Let's reproduce one of the contour plots from the kinematic analysis. And we note within the admissible region, there's a further subset of unit cell parameterizations that are, that are not bistable. And this is largely due to the stiffness of the hinges. So within the actually bistable set, we can plot the stretch factor for these unicell parameterizations, and this matches with the kinematic analysis really well. And now we can similarly plot the two criteria, including the energy barrier and the stiffness. And we note that the maxima occurs for these two contour plots at different locations. This gives us the flexibility to choose the appropriate unicell depending on specific applications. In our experiment, we always select the cell with the highest stiffness. Now we understand the behavior on a unicell level, we start the design of our deployable structures. We note that if we simply tile the same unicell in a grid, we obtain only in-plane expansion. And this does not give us a 3D geometry. So we also notice that our unicell exhibits auxetic behavior as well, which means the Poisson's ratio is negative one, as suggested before. And this kind of behavior, if we have abstract to the continuous world, can be captured by conformal deformation. So in order to get non-zero Gaussian curvature, we need a variation in expansion factor. In this case, the expansion factor is defined as the length change between the 3D surface and the 2D parameter, parameter plane. More specifically, in order to have non-zero Gaussian curvature, we need the Laplacian of the scale factor to be non-zero. So here's the design pipeline. We first have the input surface, and then we compute the conformal map of this input surface. At this stage, we verify the scale factors are within the admissible range. And then we lay out a regular grid of triangles. For each triangle, we seek along the isoline of the scale factor, the stiffest parameterization of the unit cell from the pre-computed by stable cell library. And then we tile each one of the triangles into the grid. And we fabricate this using a laser cutter. And then we're able to deploy this into the 3D. Let's illustrate this design pipeline using the design of a very simple spherical cap. In this case, we choose to use a quarter of a sphere in order to exhibit that we can use different ranges of scale factor to design the same deployed shape. So first, on the left, we use a range that goes from minimally expanding to mediumly expanding. So the middle of the surface has mediumly expanding unicells and along the ring of the surface has almost no expansion ratio. And on the right, we have in the middle of the surface, maximally expanding unicells and along the ring, mediumly expanding unicells. And of course, these result in such laser cut patterns that we can use to fabricate our physical specimens. And here are the fabricated specimens. This is a sequence of me opening both versions of the spherical cap. Note that by popping open one unicell, the neighbors get triggered as well in a cascading fashion. This makes the deployment very simple. 
we mechanically validate the stability in the deployed state and the difference in stiffness between the two geometries. We use an indenter to press down the middle of the spherical cap. And we note that even at an indentation that's almost 100% the height of the spherical cap, both geometries return back to its original state. And secondly, one ex exhibits much higher stiffness than the other. Now we can validate the shape of these two structures. Here's the photograph of their open state. And here is a distance map from the scanned geometry and the target mesh. This is obtained using photogrammetry. Note that one structure deviates quite a bit more from the target than the other. And this indicates that the less stiff version is pulled on by the gravity. And now we'll discuss several features of our bistable auxetic surface structures. One of them is the approximation of surfaces of a different topology. So here we have a cylindrical topology with the shape of a face. And in the flat state, we're able to enforce that along the stitch line, we have triangles that are compatible. And therefore we can stitch this in the closed state to form a cylinder and then proceed to open the cylinder to obtain our target shape. And this creates a very interesting artistic effect when uh, deployed. Thus far, we assume our unicells only expand during deployment. However, we're equally able to fabricate these expanded unicell in the flat state and deploy through contraction. So here we utilize the contracting side of the scale factors. And we fabricate a similar double uh, bond to demonstrate this. Note that in the flat state, these cells are pre-opened. And by contractively deploy this, we obtain a non-porous 3D state. And lastly, we are able to approximate much larger structures using almost 1,000 triangles for each one of these models to achieve a very close approximation with our target shape. Um, to widen the user base of our algorithm, we developed a grasshopper script that follows this pipeline very closely. So we first obtain the conformal mesh, then we overlay the triangular grid, compute the stretch factor, and then we seek the best unicell and fit these within the grid. And then we proceed to graphically demonstrate the deployment process. And you can check out this at the following link. There are several limitations to our pipeline. Uh, the first and foremost, we are limited in our expansion and contraction range. So at the expansion range of around one, the unit cells are not bistable due to the finite hinge thickness. And at the maximal range, we're limited by the geometry of the unit cells. Therefore, there are surfaces that we cannot approximate without the introduction of, let's say, topological singularities. Second, we have only demonstrated fabrications of deployable structure on a desktop size and for much larger structures, such as pavilions, we may need to use assemblies consisting of rigid parts and compliant joints. Lastly, there's the trade-off of having flexible materials during deployment, but stiff material in the deployed state. And lastly, as a next step, we have demonstrated that we have a viable material system, and we're able to abstract this using conformal math. And lastly, we're able to physically demonstrate the deployment of such structures, but we have yet to demonstrate a global optimization that perturbs the initial design to have a better approximation of the target surface. And this is one of our next steps. So I would like to acknowledge the anonymous reviewers for promoting our paper, and I would like to acknowledge the funding from the Swiss National Science Foundation as well as the fabrication capabilities at Flex Lab at EPFL. So thank you very much. If you would like to discuss this further, please join us on Monday, August 9th in the first session of fabrication, deployables and discrete pieces.